welcome you once more to this webinar, um, IGSN ID registration moving from interest to implementation. Uh, the point of this webinar is that um, although the partnership between Datasite and IGSN has been moving forward for the, for the last few years, um, one of the questions I have been asked regularly by uh, people interested in implementing IGSN IDs is, can we have some practical examples? So the idea today is really to showcase two exemplars. Um, so one, how from GFZ as to how you might go about creating your own uh, implementation workflow. And two, from our space where you can use the, the functionality that they offer to be able to uh, register IGSN IDs through their sample management module. So that, that's how we're going to move forward. So the first thing uh, I will do is give a very brief introduction to IGSN IDs. It was clear from the registration that a number of people um, are not uh, so familiar with IGSN IDs. So I just wanted to give uh, a sort of introductory overview and hopefully that will give you some, some uh, extra information about IGSN IDs. Obviously, you're more than welcome to contact me if, if you want more information. Um, so um, just to introduce myself very briefly, I'm Rory Edmonds. I'm the sample, uh, Samples Community Manager here at Datasite, and I will let um, Kirsten and Vida introduce themselves when they uh, when they when it's their turn to present. So first things first, uh, the IGSN ID is a globally unique and persistent identifier for material samples, and it is domain agnostic. So samples can really be any material from anywhere in the universe. And to really sort of hammer this point home, to make it clear, we really are talking all disciplines, all sample types. So I'm not going to go through these slides in detail, but, you know, uh, looking at the physical sciences, the earth space, environmental sciences and chemistry, these are some of the sorts of samples you might be thinking about. Um, from the life sciences, so biochemistry, microbiology, botany, zoology, ecology, here's some of the samples you might the types that might be uh, thinking about there. And the thing I want to emphasize is this does include live specimens. So that's one thing to, to, to really um, uh, take away from this. Um, in social sciences, so sociology, anthropology, archaeology, economics, human geography, so on and so forth. Um, applied sciences, agriculture, material sciences, and engineering, medicine. Um, again, one thing to emphasize here is it's not just about samples that you're going out and collecting. It is samples that are created, synthesized as well. So, for example, synthetic materials or prototypes would um, would also completely be come under the umbrella of an IGSN ID. Um, and even the arts. So um, th there's probably even more things you can think about, more subjects, more sample types you can think about. But this just gives you a flavor to make it clear we really are talking across the board. Um, so what can be assigned an IGSN ID? Well, obviously, you can assign them to individual material samples. But beyond that, you can actually assign them to aggregates of material samples. So you may want to apply an IGSN ID at the collection level rather than for individual samples. Um, they can be applied to what we call features of interest. So this is really the collection sites, the places where the sampling took place. You can use an IGSN ID for that. Um, the samples themselves don't have to be persistent, so they can actually be used for destroyed or discarded or ephemeral samples. We know that uh, samples may be destroyed or discarded during analytical processes. Um, they may otherwise degrade over time. Um, as long as the sample existed at some point, then it can be given an IGSN ID. And, and an, again, an important point to note here is that an IGSN ID is really for the sample itself. It can't be registered for an image of a sample. It can't be registered about an analytical data about the sample. It is really for the sample. Um, and so what are the main kind of use cases for IGSN IDs? Well, first and foremost is they give a digital presence for physical objects. So you can link a sample to the web via met the metadata, via a landing page, where the landing page is displaying a description of the material sample identified by the IGSN ID. And it should include all elements that really help improve discoverability, including domain specific metadata. 
Um, another really big and important use case for IGS NIDs is they support sample work workflows. So they support sample collection management by helping you, you link a sample with its digital representation through labeling. So for example, you could encode an IGS NID as a QR code or a barcode that would allow machine re readable identification. Uh, they, they support sample process management. So we really encourage that you apply IGS NIDs early in, in their life to track the sample throughout its life cycle and as it moves from, from place to place. These are physical things, they do move physically from location to location. And um, IGS NIDs support established sample workflows. So you can transform locally unique identifiers to globally unique ones. And that means that you don't necessarily need huge changes to your established working procedures, your naming conventions, data systems. So they can be really um, useful and easy to implement in that regard. And the final sort of main use case I want to, to uh, really focus on is cross-linking and citation. So IGSNID metadata can be used to describe relationships between a sample and any related data sets, any related publications, the people who were involved in collecting and managing that sample, any software that was used as part of the analysis processes. Um, and this is really for the purposes of discovery and credit. But also, obviously, with samples, they do come from a collection site. They are subsampled uh, very often. So you can connect IGS NIDs to mirror hierarchical relationships. Um, and the, the hopefully this is uh, something that, that you know about, but um, the, the main, uh, the big news has been over the last few years is that we've had a partnership between DataSite and the IGSN organization. And through that uh, DataSite services to register IGSN IDs for material samples and is now open to all DataSite members, all consortium organizations. And we do have support documentation as well. Um, uh, so, what, what is an IGS NID compared to a DOI? Well, IGS NIDs are functionally DOIs because they're now registered through data site services. Um, and that means that they you can use our existing uh, system services in order to um, both register and locate uh, IGS NIDs. So, IGS NIDs can be registered through our Fabrica web interface. And probably more importantly for this particular talk, you can use or you can create your own integrations um, using our data site APIs, or you can use integrations from data site service providers. So you'll see an example from GFZ of, of the second of these. And for the third of these, RSpace is the first data site regis uh, uh, registered service provider uh, that al allows the option of registering IGS NIDs. Um, IGS NID metadata is included, encoded in the data site metadata schema. So this is no different to the way that you would register any other research output. Um, and IGS NIDs in the same way as any other DOI, they have a prefix, they have a suffix, they resolve to landing pages. And as I've already intimated, you can fi find findable IGS NIDs in data site commons, in API queries and uh, any other discovery services. But what's the difference? How do IGS NIDs differ from DOIs? Well, at the moment, the we really differentiate at the repository level. So differentiating IGS NIDs at the metadata record level is coming. It will hopefully be included in metadata schema 5.0. But at the moment, we do it at the repository level. So IGS NIDs must be registered in an IGS ID catalog repository. And then an IGS ID. ID catalog repository must be used to exclusively register IGS NIDs. So that by doing this, we know that if something is in an IGS NID catalog repository, it is an IGS NID, and therefore we can limit to those uh, repositories in order for um, harvesting or searching capabilities and so on and so forth. I don't really have time to go through the IGS NID metadata, but I've, as I've already intimated, it is encoded in the data site metadata schema. Uh, an important thing to, to notice is that uh, all IGS NIDs are registered with the resource type general schema property set to physical object. 
And we have worked with the IGSN organization to develop specific metadata guidance. And also we've um, created some best practices for enriching IGSN IDs. Uh, and then uh, pretty much finally, I think um, I just wanted to sort of, because we're talking about uh, registration workflows, um, just some considerations that you may want to consider when you're you're creating your IGSN ID uh, workflow. Um, because you need to be able to use an IGSN ID catalog repository on top of potentially your DOI repositories, uh, you need to check whether your current system really does handle multiple data site repository account credentials and prefixes. Um, you need to decide who should manage an IGSN ID catalog repository, because obviously there is a much more disciplinary element here that um, means that it may make more sense for disciplinary experts to have more control. Um, what metadata sources are available to dis assist the discovery and distinction of, of the samples? Um, what elements are needed for landing pages? Uh, are these elements common across departments, discipline, organizational units? And, and again, sort of similar to who manages the repositories, who's creating and hosting the landing pages? Because again, there needs to be some disciplinary expertise involved in this. Um, and I think that's everything I want to say. There's some, some resources for you. Um, uh, again, these slides will be available. So um, yeah, you can click on those at your leisure. Uh, whoops. And thank you very much. Please feel free to reach out and uh, if you have any um, uh, questions. Um, thank you. And I'll stop sharing. And I will um, move swiftly on to, to Kirsten to um, talk about GFZ and their um, uh, integration with Datasite and how they've been using IGSN IDs. Okay, thanks Rory for the introduction and especially your great presentation. I'll try to share my slides. Um, hang on, here we go. Now you see them correctly? Yeah, we do. Okay, some brief words from myself. I'm working at the GFZ, the German Research Center for Geosciences in Potsdam, Germany. I'm working, I always call myself, I'm a data person, like I'm running a research data repository, GFZ Data Services, which is also operating the IGSN implementation workflow. And um, as Rory said, it is, we, we have different systems, but they are somehow connected because data need to be cited, no, samples need to be cited in data, et cetera, PP. And I'm speaking on behalf of also my two colleagues, Simone Frenzel and Alexander Browser, who without them we couldn't have this the service um okay but i start very very early <laughs> when igsn ev was funded that was already in 20 uh, in 2012 and already at that time there were two members of gfz being involved in this in this founding of igsn ev which is the organization that has been taking care of developing metadata schemas and running igsn GFZ was one of, or is one, no, I speak until the 30, 31st December 2022, because this is when we changed to use data site services. Until then, G GFZ data services was, or GFZ was one of 10 allocating agents, internationally under allocating agents, and we are speaking about almost 11 million registered IGSNs before we, we joined with data site. GFZ was also responsible for the central handle server until December 2022. That means that by that until that time, every each and every IGSN was registered through that one handle server. And and this is what it's like the introduction to what I'm saying below. There is no central sample database at GFZ. We have many groups across all the earth sciences, beginning with geodesy, geophysics, different geological, geochemists everything you can imagine on earth sciences. And therefore, we have to customize our, our workflows and our offers to be specific to, to the groups who would be interested in, including a very large part of long tail communities. And this is what I will show you. Like, I can't show you like, like what, what VIDA will do. We have, they have the system and here you can use it, but we have different ways how to get metadata and different people we can, we, we've been working together. 
Okay, but I start with the modular metadata schema because it's important to understand also the difference between data site and the data site metadata schema, the IGSN. And this is already at the time when we had the handle server, there was a very small number of mandatory fields that was complemented by a descriptive metadata that was mainly serving for discovery purposes. The original idea was that this is like the shared descriptive metadata by all allocating agents. And then on top of that, there was a lot of freedom to develop domain agnostic, domain specific metadata for different, and I'm speaking of the geosciences, different subdomains, uh, petroleum geology, um, scientific drilling and everything. So this was already the original idea of a very flexible metadata schema. And, and this is also something that is important since 2016, IGSN is a related identifier type in the data set metadata schema. And this is actually the first identifier for physical objects that has ever been included as formal way to be cited. And if you see it, this is one of our DUI landing pages for a data set. And that is a scientific drilling program. And included in addition to citing different papers that are related, we also cite the samples, and at this case, this case, that's the not not all the four thousand samples of this drilling project, but the three main boreholes. And this is possible since twenty sixteen in the machine readable metadata we sent to data site. Okay, so what do I need for IGSN? That is pretty pretty straightforward. First, you need a sample, and you put the IGSN on the sample, and this usually has a QR code that leads to the landing page. And it's important to say that the IGSN is not replacing any sample number, but it's complementary. So you see here the sample number, which is repeated also on the IGSN tag. Here is the QR code, and that is the IGSN number. And by clicking on the, or by, by resolving this QR code, you reach the, the IGSN landing page, which is actually the online sample description according to the metadata schema or metadata profile for different sample types. The parent property has always been mandatory whenever it has existed and was key to make the connection between different samples, subsamples, and subsubsamples. And we use this connection to visualize a sample family tree where you can actually browse through a, a big number of samples from a scientific drilling project or others. And this, this meant that you can not only, you don't only know the, the parent, but you also know you like brothers and sisters of samples. You see how many cores have been taken, how many samples have been collected. Maybe one of them would be interesting in. And this is like all coming from the interpretation of the metadata. Of course, when possible, we show the location of the sample on a map. And this is also specific for like for the IGS and metadata. We provide information on the actual sample location, the core repository or the lab where potential users might be contacting a person to ask whether they can also take a sample of it. And of course, we have linked to related papers that is in this example, not shown, but whenever there is a paper related to a sample, we cited similar to we do what we do on data publications. Okay, and then of course we have our catalog that has different search filters according to sample type material classification. The spatial search and free search is currently not, not there. And these links, like the set from the catalog, you directly link to the landing pages. There's an API for metadata exchange that is connecting to data site. And our data centers are actually representing our different user groups. And they are different disciplines, different persons, like we have the International Continental Scientific Drilling Program. We have different critical zone observatories, and this allows us to to be specific on the metadata, what I, what I explained before. So that is our catalog. Um, but how do we get the information? That is always the crucial point because of course you need a lot of information and our clients, as I mentioned, are having samples of different stages of digitization. One of them is for example, the International Continental Scientific Drilling Program and their sample metadata is already recorded in digital drilling information systems, it's called MDIS or this, this MDIS is the more, more modern one, the mobile drilling information system. So they already have a database. So for getting IGS and metadata, we developed autom semi-automated export routines to paste information from the metadata directly into the XMLs of data site. And these were then registered by the allocating agent at GFZ data services. 
And so far we have registered like almost 16,000 samples for different scientific drilling projects. And it's pretty much automatized because the routines are there and the data model is similar. The other example is was developed for a, a priority program of the German Research Association, DFG. It's called Earthshape. It's a critical zone observatory. And for them, we have actually developed a digital sample management system that was further developed from an original electronic lab notebook, Medusa. And this already has an integrated IGSN registration. So people can click on a button to register their IGSN. And to keep the integrity of a sample tree, we make sure that if a sample, for example, from the fourth hierarchy is, is registered, every parent is registered until the, the very first sample. And we have already, and that's not us because it's our, our, our users who are actually using and filling this, this database, so far, there have been 4,000 plus samples registered for this critical zone observatory. Um, and then we had the luck to, to get a project funded where we could do a lot of implementation to further use IGS, and especially also for, for normal researchers who had no access to a database, but still wanted to get IGS for their, their samples. And this, this project is called Fair Wish, Fair Workflows to Establish IGSN for Samples in the Helmholtz Association. And it was funded through the Helmholtz Metadata Collaboration. And this is somehow, we have we are three Helmholtz centers, the Alfred Wigner Institute, GFZ, and Helmholtz Center Herion. And each has a use case um, representing digital, a different level of digitizations, beginning with a very basic, with really paper and analog or small tables that collected sample descriptions for Arctic land expedition samples from, from Russian German expeditions. The GFZ example is also an example for using the, the drilling information system. So there's already a database that can be harvested, that can be exported and get the IGSN metadata. And Herion had a, a up and running a very modern automated, no, a biogeochemical sample database that is filled with a field app, for example, and there we, we wanted to, or we developed automated IGSN assignment. And um, the objectives were, was on one hand to develop these workflows to, workflows to generate machine readable IGSN metadata from these different states of digitization and also workflows to automatically register IGSNs, but also we looked very much into further developing the metadata profiles to develop discipline-specific metadata schemas for different sample types, including um, the identification of controlled vocabularies that we would like to include in uh, linked data, use, but I, I come to this later. Okay, in the middle of our project, we had this change from for IGSN with the IGSN data site partnership, which meant that we did not only have to develop what we wanted to do, but we had to make sure that we also map everything of us to the data site metadata schema, or not everything, because I, I want to do to, to this to display the the difference between the two the metadata schemas. So I, I mentioned the original IGSN metadata, very rich highly granular and very sample, sample specific. And this had to be moved to add the minimum data sites mandatory metadata properties. And just comparing the metadata properties, identifier, creator, type, year, publisher, resource type, of course, we recommended several additional sub, uh, properties that were yeah, recommended for discovery. But um, it is absolutely clear that there are different roles for the two metadata schemas. IGSN metadata are very granular, specific to get rich and comprehensive sample descriptions, whereas data site metadata is involved, is developed for citation and discovery purposes. And the question then is, of course, how much can be mapped into the data site metadata schema? How much I think data site metadata will never be able to fully describe samples. So it's always good to have a dedicated sample catalog. 
And one of the biggest challenges in the partnership steering group of IGS and DataSite for developing these recommendations was, for example, the required metadata field. What is a title? Because there are no titles for, for samples. But then we decided on suggesting a composite title where we try to put in some content to improve discovery. Other questions um, are, of course, how complete could or should IGS and metadata be mapped? And especially when I look into, and I'm now speaking as vice president of IGS NEV, um, the general, like the, the overall steering organization of, of IGS N now, when everyone can directly register data site without contacting us, how can we keep consistency between allocating agents? So as, as IGS NEV, we would be really interested in, in getting in touch with new agent, agents to to support them, to help, but also to learn and maybe improve our services. Okay, what are our results? First and foremost, we, we documented the IGS and metadata schema, quite comprehensive. Um, and we also had looked into recommendations for linked open data vocabs. Um, what I mean are um, RDF SCOS compliant registered vocabularies that we can include in the specific in the sample type specific metadata profiles. This is not yet done. We will do it in the in the next step because we are, have to do all the transition from the old system to the new one. But within the, the Fairwish project, we had, for example, vegetation and water samples and sediments that are more or less new that came in by the use case of, of Alfred Wigner Institute. We already had a subset of that for the critical zone observatory. But we, we had the opportunity of really looking into what can we use. Are there any registered controlled vocabularies that we can recommend? And of course, if we recommend it, it would be great if others would, would do so. Or we can discuss with IGS NEV. And the main product is actually uh, our fair samples template. That is a customizable Excel template to provide standardized sample descriptions, which is dedicated to be used by normal researchers who have no clue on XML metadata, but they do have sample descriptions. And you can actually select the metadata properties that you like in the first page. And then on the second tab of this Excel sheet, you will have your, your personal metadata um, table that you can fill with your sample informations. We then, and this is what I show in the next slide, we have uh, developed a code to map to actually read the metadata descriptions from the templates into the IGSN metadata. And we have a video tutorial that um, explains how to use the template. This template in its second version is suitable for individual and hierarchical samples. We have already identified some um, some uh, things to be improved in the next version where and we are hoping that a new new proposal will be um granted where we want to further automatize these this um this template to be really um to for example include all these um controlled vocabularies in nominal lists and not require them to to copy and paste for, for technical reasons this was at the moment as boss as necessary but there are like that's our, our first of the further steps and to connect everything and especially to um to to support the transition from our old system with a handle and also to somehow stepwise re renew our software stack um simone has developed a software that's called samira sample igs and registration automation where that actually reads various inputs from this uh, Fairwish template or from database bases, it creates IGSN objects, writes the XMLs in IGSN or data site um, um, versions, metadata uh, schemas, and communicates via REST. The, the green samples, the green fields are already implemented. The half green are in progress, and in the future, that is what what we are aiming at. So the input are different versions of sample descriptions usually provided as CSV or directly from databases, um, or maybe, yeah. It is um, 
we get the IGSM registration metadata object, the descriptive metadata, the specific that we still need for our, DUI, for our IGSM metadata. And we will, and this is um, also already almost implemented, have the data site metadata object. So this software is meant to be very, very generic and to, to be very flexible at the same time. And this shall bridge the IGSN legacy system with the new one that we are subsequently um, developing. And the output are, at this moment, XMLs, but also database entries are the next one, and JSON is, is on the long run. And this via Samira, we will communicate with data site for DOI registration. It is, I think, already filling. I don't know if we still, it's it's about to be ready for also be used for, for the IGS and landing pages. So far, we use a PHP implementation and, of course, the, the catalog, and it's connected, it will be connected to the OAE page. And that's what Simone said. It will be better on the next version. So I think on the next version, which is expected end of May, all these half green fields will be, or functionalities will be already implemented. And as Outlook, of course, we want to further automatize the sample registration workflows. We want to get, have a full and user-friendly implementation of controlled vocabs in the template that is then used by people and the metadata schema because you would have to have both. We will be ready to connect to additional lab management systems and also look further into the development of samples type specific services. And, and this is something that I'm really keen in, in, in further developing. We have a connection, we would like to connect to samples beyond the earth cases, earth sciences. And at the moment we are, we are discussing with colleagues from the photon and neutron sciences, like which is uh, material sciences. And hopefully we get the funding to be ready to to really start on how to connect it to IGSN. And with this, and on behalf of the GFZ team and of the full Fair Wish team, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you so much, Kirsten. That was really interesting. So a quick reminder that if you have any questions, please do use the Q&A functionality. The other thing I wanted to mention very briefly is that I, I will be working with Kirsten, um, or after this webinar, to put together a blog post where we will uh, also talk about some of these these great things that that GFZ has been working on, and um, so that will give you a little bit more insight and information as well. Um, so, but uh, limited time today, so I'll swiftly move on to uh, Vida. Uh, Vida, if you would like to share your screen, and please go ahead and, and yes. introduce yourself. Yeah, so hopefully you can see my screen. I'll put it in slideshow mode. So we can indeed. Um, yeah, so I'll be talking about um, sample management uh, while using IGS and IDs in our space inventory. So, uh, what is our space? Our space is a research platform for institutional research data management. So to keep it simple, you have an electronic lab notebook aspect, you have a sample management aspect, and then you have integrations with various tools. Um, so this is what it ends up looking like. This is a little bit overwhelming and we don't have time, so I won't go over it all. But the idea is that you you can use our space to connect and access various things that you might already have in your workflow. Um, and we're going open source uh, this quarter, which is very exciting. So uh, yeah, feel free to ask me more about that as well. Um, so the we worked on a collaboration with Datasite to prototype a seamless integration of what would it look like if you had IGS and IDs within a sample management system and you were able to, to just naturally register, edit the metadata and publish the IGS and IDs. Um, part of the uh, inspiration for really focusing on the usability was that uh, we talked to various institutions about their real life uh, workflows, uh, research and sample workflows. And a lot of the time they said that uh, it's hard for researchers if there's various points of uh, entry, there's like one tool they have to use for registering one thing, and then they have to use another tool for analysis and another tool for something else. And uh, th that could really create friction. So we tried to see how can we really embed IGS and IDs within our, uh, our system. 
so I'd like to do a little demo of what that looks like. So um, ignore the section on the left. It's just that I have all my tabs on the left side. Uh, but you've, you've, you've got the uh, electronic lab, lab notebook aspects where you have your various documents and then you have your um, inventory system here. And just to go uh, go over it a little bit, you have various concepts on, on the left here. You have a bench, you have containers and samples and subsamples. You can also create um, templates for samples. So basically metadata templates uh, where, where the main agnostics where you can choose uh, what you want to represent by a container and a sample and, and, and so on. Um, on the middle here, you have your actual listings that you can view in different formats uh, to, and like various search components. And on the right side, you have your item that you're viewing. In this case, I'm viewing uh, a sample. Um, and there's various metadata here that I can input. Uh, I can also uh, input some custom fields here. Uh, we can see that there's one aliquot here as well. Um, and so what we've done here is that if you um, if you look at every single item uh, in inventory, they all have this identifier section, uh, which means that you can click on uh, the little plus icon to create an IJSN ID, and that's done automatically as you're viewing this object. Um, so you'll see some familiar properties from what Kirsten mentioned, uh, the, the core properties uh, for IGSNs that we automatically populate based on information we know about the person. So we know their name, uh, we know uh, the their institution name and so on. Um, you can also input some recommended properties. Um, and uh, there's also various other aspects. And I would like to first show a one, um, a complete record, what a complete record would look like, because uh, that's a bit more, more interesting. Uh, so in here, um, I have one that I, I've added uh, some subjects to uh, together with their uh, URI value. I've added the description to this um, to, to this item. I've also added an alternate identifier. So maybe I'm using a different type of ID uh, within my own system and I wanna make sure that that's recorded. Uh, I've added the date that I've collected the sample. And then here we have these nice little interactive maps so that you can define geolocations, let's say a polygon or a box or a point or where, for example, you collected this item. And it's all nicely interactive and you can add several geolocations if you're referring to different aspects. Um, and so um, what does this look like for someone who is wanting to, to, to find the sample from outside the institution? So what happens is that you have uh, the option to publish your information. So let us let me go back to that sample I just created that doesn't, doesn't have that much in it. But what I can do is I can preview uh, the landing page and look what the information will look like. And I can click on publish and that gives me some information about um, what happens to this uh, metadata, the fact that it will now become public. Uh, just we really try to make every single step really explicit like here for example well okay this igsn id is now findable here's how you can cite it um here's how it can be accessed so that it's clear when the information is made public and that's always an active part from the researcher to trigger uh, that kind of um publicity um and so then you end up with a with a page that's accessible uh, externally by everyone um obviously here it's not, it doesn't sound that interesting because it doesn't have anything that's that specific to that sample, right? So once you start completing the record, it starts uh, filling up with various domain specific information. And then the various geolocations are also uh, interactive in here on the landing page. Um, and one thing that we realized would be really useful to have as well is that if uh, you're filling in information about your sample in here, uh, already in your sample management system, domain specific information, then it would be useful if you could just automatically put that on the landing page. It's it's not gonna be IGSN specific um, information, but as mentioned in the previous talks, you don't you don't need uh, everything to be matched up. Like some information could just be on the landing page. So we have this uh, handy section here that just says, uh, would you like to include the fields 
from this sample uh, on the landing page. And here's a list of all the fields that will be included. Um, and you do, you save that, and then you go and you republish the page. So again, like a, an active action. And then when you open the landing page, it now has uh, the description, the tags, and then a, a table with all of the metadata fields. So the, the researcher didn't have to go through a separate process of copy pasting these values and so on. It's all centralized and they could choose what they made public and they can choose to retract and hide these inventory fields as well. Um, yeah, and uh, mentioning about retracting, you can also obviously retract the IGSN ID and then that explains what state it moves into, uh, its visibility, and you can always republish as well. Uh, and it's always clear where the um, what the DOI is um, in here. Um, and on the landing page, another thing that's useful to mention is that because we, in our system, we can, um, let's say, add um, an ORCID ID for the researcher and um, also the system administrator can specify a, a, a ROAR for this RSpace server, meaning this institution has this ID and they're using this RSpace server. Once you attach this um, to the server, and this is done just once by the system administrator, on the landing page, automatically we link the creator affiliation to be that institution, because that makes sense. And again, that uses the uh, nice um, like um, persistent ID, um, which is good. And that means that that gets all then passed to um, data site. And if I refresh this, I should hopefully be able to see. Yeah, I've got my antibody here, my in my test date, the site Fabrica account. I can open it. Um, I can I can see uh, a nice view of the fact that all of the information has been added in there. And so the idea is that you can then use something like data site commons to uh, query and find these samples or uh, some kind of domain specific um, uh, querying can also be set up. Um, and I let me let me see if I've got anything else there. Uh, yeah, so for the system administrator side of things, like in terms of setting this up, there's a settings panel where you set up your API key and so on, but there's really not much more to do there. And for researchers, that's completely obscure. They don't need to know how things are configured. It just kind of works, um, hopefully. Um, and so just to quickly go over um, this, uh, if you want more information, uh, we have a documentation page on this. Uh, we made good use of the data site uh, metadata recommendations helper page uh, because those are the fields that we ended up implementing as like easy access within the system. Uh, we also wrote this interoperability guideline uh, document as part of the project because we realized that um, there's a lot of um, things that it can be confusing when trying to work between an institution and uh, a PID registration service and and uh, an integrator. You know, I know Rory mentioned this already. Like, what what exactly is a landing page? What does it include? What does it mean to be findable? What does curation mean? Um, and uh, detailed user research and understanding really what is the integration that you need for your institution. Um, I think was really uh, useful for us. Um, so next steps is that we're working on more of an end-to-end -end workflow. So you can register IGSNs within inventory, but what if you're collecting the samples first in, uh, in the field and you're offline? Um, what if you're wanting to push out some data sets from the ELN side of our space and you want to make sure that the IGSN IDs are recorded as part of that? Um, also working on uh, support for additional PIDs as well, so linking those in. Um, and an interesting idea as well is uh, if you have several uh, bodies that um, handle the registration of IGS and IDs, then it, it might be useful if, uh, let's say, from our space, you'd able to say, well, I actually want to push all of this metadata and for it to be hosted on this domain specific repository. Um, and since both of them use the IGS send schema in the background, that, that would be fairly kind of intuitive to, to conceptualize at least. Um, so uh, yeah, the closing thoughts is from this experience is that 
we learned that iterating and kind of starting small and then building up the features was really a good way to go and really understanding what is the context of this is the pit we want to use at this institution in this domain and what how are researchers wanting to interact with it i think was a key uh, uh approach that re really benefited us there and yeah uh, that's that's all from me um yeah you have those links and links that in the chat so hopefully that's that's useful and yeah i'm looking forward to hearing more and please get in touch if you feel like not not all of your ideas and id uh in our space inventory questions have been answered yeah thank you Thank you so much, Vida. Um, so we have about uh, 10 minutes left. So um, maybe if you stop sharing, Vida yeah. and um, yes. Kirsten, and you can and I can all be front and center, then we can um, add, answer questions that have already been added to the Q&A. If you have any more, uh, please uh, feel free. Um, again, everything that's here will be shared. The recording and all of the slide decks will be shared um, very soon after the webinar. We will be contacting all of the registrants, so you will you will get a message that tells you this is available. Um, so we've got a few uh, uh, questions or, already, um, and I think it's just easiest probably if we answer these live. Um, so the first, and I apologize for everybody um, the, the, if I mispronounce your name, and I see that Kirsten has already answered uh, Mar Madison's <laughs> question, but um, <laughs> Mad Madison uh, Langseth basically asked, um, IGS NIDs are not for digitized representations, so ID, uh, basically e.g. a photo of a rock or mineral. Um, if you have a photo of the sample, would you just include that photo as additional metadata? Or would you recommend getting another identifier for the image? I think the simple answer is great, included in the landing page as additional metadata. I think that's important. But with my data set hat on, I'm data set hat on, I'm also going to say getting a DOI for that image would be uh, even better. And linking that in the landing page through the meta metadata, connecting metadata would would make sense as well. Uh, Kirsten, you have a different. I I have I have a question to that because I um if you if you added additional DOIs for the images that are just related to the IGSN, this would be um ex expanding the the problem that we already have with IGSN because. Um, you would just produce so many DOIs, and every one has to be maintained for the for eternity and citable and everything. So I think already at the when when I compare a data publication, for example, of a geochemical data, they they usually use up to hundred samples. So we have this one table with each sample represented in a line, and of course each sample has an IGSN. So you have like 10, they have, have like 100 IGSNs for one data publication. And adding the images of these samples in addition would mean to have yet another hundreds. And this is something yeah. that I don't, I don't know, disagree. This is, yeah. this is sensitive. Tens yeah, that's the point. So, so I, I guess let me rephrase what I'm saying then. If there is a reason to refer to that image, then I would personally recommend that you have. A DOI, you know, it's it's the same with with the, the the point is if you want someone to be able to easily discover and potentially cite that image, then of course it makes sense. It may not make sense in all cases, um, but yeah, I think it depends on how you wish to use yeah. that image. Uh, but should. yes, at yeah. a minimum, yeah, having it in the landing page is is definitely. Yeah. Strongly it can be part of the related data publication, for example. Exactly. We have, yeah. yeah, but I would just, I'm, I'm just a bit cautious to just be exploding. Add, the yeah, add this. Yes. For this, this has to be there for the long term and persistent and everything. Yeah, I, I don't disagree with you, you Kirsten. Uh, but again, I, yeah, I think there, if there is a reason to, to um, add 
a DOI, then I certainly would would strongly encourage that, but at a minimum on the landing page. So one for you, Kirsten, was from, uh, and this, this came in during your talk from Raymond Obuch. Uh, what software is used to harvest and translate metadata to other metadata catalogs? Python query. Um, well, we, no, we don't use Python. We, um, I don't know how they extract it from this drilling, drilling information system, to be honest, but we use usually, um, Traditionally, we use XMLs and we provide them through OEPMH better, um, protocols. That's a bit um, traditional, but that's how everything worked. And um, our landing pages are made with PHP. So we don't use Python, but of course we can use it. But that's like we use the normal standardized ways to exchange metadata. I think RESTful APIs and, and OEPMH for XMLs. Is this answering your question? Uh, uh, well, Raymond, if, if I hope that answers see. your question. If not, <laughs> please uh, please add uh, a, a note to, to let us know. Um, so someone who's uh, anonymous says, uh, is I basically asking about what a QR code would contain? When, because I mentioned, obviously, that is a way of linking. Effectively, it is the QR code encodes uh, the resolvable landing page so you're basically so the point is with a sample is um it's tr you are obviously by creating the igsn id effectively creating a digital footprint for that sample but of course it is also a physical object that will be picked up handled used by people so it kind of makes sense generally with labeling to think about two things one having some human readable um labeling but also having the 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 resolvable IG, igsn id within the qr code so that then you could scan that and bring up the landing page bring up the information uh, connected with that sample um but not could, just to add because i read it in the question not the url of the landing page no no, because not the URL. Because this will change the, if some yeah, URL the changes, IGSN we ID. have to do this. It is really, that's why the IGSN is there. And nowadays we use UIR plus prefix plus IGSN suffix. So that is important. Use the PID. The, the PID. And what not we, the URL. Uh, the, the URL, yeah. Yeah, exactly. But what we always, it depends on the groups. So some groups um even put the resolvable URL, which is HTTPS, IGSN, org, slash, at, at these handle times. And they also put it next to the QR code, just in case there's no digital um, tool to, to read the QR code or the, the cell phone is um, cropped, uh, cropped, uh, switched out, off or something. But, but um, usually we recommend to add the sample name and ideally the, the IGSN number with this resolving URL. And then the QR code. All right. Um, so now there was several questions for Vida, um, and Vida has been answering them. So um, I don't know, Vida, if you want to add anything more to any of these. So um, is R Space open source? So um, the R Space is currently finishing up an open source preparation. Uh, we'll be going open source this quarter. Um, does R space inventory generate QR codes for samples registered with IS IGSN IDs? Um, yes, R space does. Uh, barcoding is the property of any entity, irrespective of IGSN ID registration. Um, and then, sorry, I'm not uh, saying people's names because I need to get through things rather quickly. Um, uh, uh, but here's one from uh, Torga Peterson. Does our space allow to handle credentials from multiple repositories? Uh, Vida, maybe that's one. Yeah, um, uh, it, I'm not sure if this means like data site, you know, different like uh, repositories or in terms of, uh, you know, Dataverse, Nodo and all of that. But 
uh, yeah, we, we do support that for, for various repositories and uh, we're always just kind of looking for use cases of which repositories it makes sense to support several credentials for. Uh, so yeah, that, that's definitely something we support. Okay. And there was also another question from Torga was how to, uh, how is access management handled? Um, and you've put the, you've already answered this. So there's user roles for the PI, lab admin, user, system admin that can be set up into lab groups or project groups and uh, given more details there. Um, right. Uh, Matt McMahon, do we require a separate subscription to our data site subscription in order to produce IGS NODs, or are they available with our existing DI facility? Um, no. So the only difference, again, these are IGS NIDs are functionally DOIs. That means um, your existing uh, you can create them, uh, register them under your existing membership. The only thing to remember is that one I, IGSN ID is equal to one DOI. So there's no extra charge as such through your membership fees, your service fees. But of course, you would be creating more DOIs. Therefore, of course, your, your, uh, you, you, you would increase the costs from, from that perspective. And to, to follow, follow on for that, uh, our space uh, is a service provider, meaning we let you interface with your data site kind of account and repository. So there is no extra fee to use the IGS and ID uh, uh, feature on our, our space side. You just have to enable it and connect to the data site API. Yeah, but it's strongly recommended. That is what Rory said at the beginning to really use a different prefix for your samples yeah. and call it IGS and ID repository. And you okay. can, as a data site member, you can use as many prefixes as you want you just have to ask them to get it and then you you can make different repositories within your igsn membership and this is yeah. the same for direct members and for consortium members yeah so everyone yeah. so it's not recommended that you must if you are creating a repository for igsn ids it must be designated as a type igsn catalog repository and yes, you can create as many of those as you like to split up your connect collection in whatever way makes sense to you. Um, but yes, they must, all IGSN IDs must be in an IGSN catalog repository type repository, um, just to be very clear. Um, so we've um, reached the end, and I see there's possibly a few more questions. We'll deal with those offline. Um, I So I will get back, make sure that, that um, Vida and Kirsten are aware of them and we can get back to you um, personally with the responses. Again, we will have the video and the slides up as soon as possible. Thank you so much again for joining us today. I really hope this has helped you understand how you might create your own workflows to use data site APIs um, and, and to implement IGSN IDs or if you are more interested in going through our space as a data site registered service provider, then um, using this sample management module functionality is also a really nice and easy option for you and your, your organization. So again, thank you for joining and uh, we look forward to continuing the discussions with everyone. So take care everyone. Thank, yeah, thank you, you so much. much. Yeah, thank you.